Hey everyone, um, now that we've talked about what acute kidney injury is and the stages and the different types, now we're gonna talk about how do we treat this? So if you remember as a whole, acute kidney injury is where I've had, you know, an acute or rapid, um, you know, uh, assault of my kidneys, you know, where they've been very sensitive, their feelings are hurt, they're not functioning well. So overall, of course, this is something that we mentioned that you can recover from. So my goals or priorities are going to be, of course, one, first and foremost, to recover from that loss of kidney function. Um, fluid and electrolyte balance is going to be so key because these patients cannot manage their fluid and electrolytes because their kidneys are hurting, they're not working well. We want to manage their symptoms, fatigue, anxiety, and try to improve those if possible. Um, infection is a uh, very, very high risk of mortality. So we want to try to do things to try to protect them with that. And we want to also support their nutrition, which can be affected by their acute kidney injury. So let's kind of break these down. How are we going to meet these goals or priorities? First and foremost, you know, we want them to recover from their loss of kidney function. So in order to do that, I have to find the cause. So remember our pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal, I need to find the cause. What type of acute kidney injury is this? What is the thing assaulting my kidney? Is I'm not, I don't have enough pressure coming down to my kidneys. And so because I don't have enough pressure, therefore um, my kidneys are shutting down. So I need more pressure. I need more fluid. Am I dehydrated? Um, do I have decreased cardiac output? What's going on? Um, is there actually trauma in my kidneys or is there medications that have hurt my kidneys? Is there something that has directly attacked inside my kidneys? If so, you know, trying to do things to help with that. If there's an obstruction or something else after my kidneys causing the problem, I need to try to remove that. Um, and then of course, preventing further damage. So all those things, like let's say that my problem was that I had an obstruction, like so that um, like maybe they had a, you know, a kidney stone or something like that, or maybe they have a prostate issue. If I fix that problem, I also want to prevent them from getting other types of kidney injury. So as they're recovering from their um, prostate issues, I wanna make sure no damage happens in the kidney and that their blood pressure and that flow to the kidney stays good. And they they don't get um, any sort of decreased um, blood pressure and things like that. So trying to manage everything else to prevent them from having other causes of acute kidney injury happen. Um, also fluid and electrolyte balance. So I want to treat them for their high potassium. We're going to talk about that here on the next slide, what we do for that. And they're going to need EKG monitoring because remember anytime potassium is high or low, we're going to be worried about dysrhythmias death. You know, we always have to worry about that life and death, um, you know, potassium levels when it gets altered. Uh, this patient may also need calcium supplements or phosphate binders. You know, one of the other roles of the kidneys is to manage your calcium and phosphate balance. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, uh, we cut, um, it works opposite some of your endocrine um, organs and things like that to help maintain that balance. But when your kidneys aren't doing their part, these can get off. So a lot of times these patients have very high phosphorus levels. So I'm um, just kind of finding that balance with them. Um, diuretics um, to help with the fluid and electrolyte balance. If they're holding on to fluids, sometimes diuretics can help to let go of that. Um, a lot of these patients are going to be on a fluid restriction of like 600 milliliters plus whatever they're peeing or putting out, um, or if they have any other drains or anything like that. Um, and then sometimes if it comes down to it, they're going to need dialysis. It might only be temporary, but just to help them to get that fluid off. So we're talking about hyperkalemia. So there's a couple different ways we can treat high potassium. There's first, like the most common thing you're gonna see is what I call the trifecta. So we give insulin, because if you remember back, um, you know, we talked about insulin and potassium working opposite, kind of think back to adult, all those crazy days where Mrs. Woodruff was talking about how when you get started on an insulin drip, then your potassium goes down because insulin drives potassium into the cells. So that's one of the things we give, we give intravenous. And if you remember what's the kind of insulin, we can give IV, regular insulin. So you give regular insulin IV. And then of course, I only want to, if I'm going to give a bunch of insulin, a lot of these patients aren't diabetic. So I need to um, give them some sort of sugar. I can't just give someone a bunch of insulin. So I'm going to give them insulin. I'm going to give them D50, which is a bunch of pure sugar. And then I'm also going to give them calcium gluconate. And the point of the calcium gluconate is it stabilizes the heart. I'm about to cause a bunch of stuff shifting in and out of the cells. And by doing so, that can actually lead to um, a lot of cardiac instability. So effectively, I usually hang some calcium 
calcium and get that going to stabilize the heart. I, get, I push the insulin IV, I give the D50, um, and then I'm monitoring their blood sugar and everything really closely because I just gave them some insulin and some sugar and want to see where it's at. But that insulin is going to push that potassium, um, uh, what do you call it, back into the cells so that your blood levels get lower. That D50 is going to stabilize that blood sugar and then the calcium is going to stabilize the heart um, so it can tolerate all these shifting, uh, these things that are shifting. Um, another option is sometimes we can give what's called K-exalate. And this is my least favorite option because it causes the patient to poop a whole bunch. It's it literally, um, it, it works just in the gastrointestinal system. I can give it orally, they can swallow it. I can give it up the butt, give it by enema. But effectively what it does is in the bowels, it grabs potassium, it leaches onto it and it causes you to poop it out. So it literally grafts and sucks all the potassium out of the inside of your bowels um, and causes you to poop a whole bunch out. It's not fun. Um, but it gets rid of your potassium. It's a lot better than dysrhythmia and death. So, um, and then of course, in case of emergency, if their potassium is so high and none of this stuff is working, sometimes we have to give them dialysis. It's the only way to get it off. Now, if it's not so serious, it's just a little bit high and we can kind of work on it a little bit. We also want to look at dietary restriction, trying to lower the amount of potassium that they're getting in their diet. So other ways um, we talked about like, you know, that we need to help them is by managing their symptoms. So they're gonna be tired. So I'm um, teaching them energy conservation techniques and they might need to rest a little bit more. Even if they're active people, this might be a time where they just need to let their body, um, you know, kind of get some rest because right now it's fighting a lot. Remember there's all those waste building up that can cause that fatigue. Um, itching is really common because they have that waste building up and it you're, literally tries to get it out of your skin because your body's like so desperate to get rid of all this waste. It can try to get excreted through your skin. Again. So there's a couple medications, um, hydroxyzine or diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl. Both of those can be used, um, you know, to kind of help with some of that itching associated with um, kidney disease. Um, anxiety and depression, uh, we can give anti-anxiety agents, counseling, uh, therapeutic communications, of course, antidepressants and things as well. Um, the number one cause of death in AKI is infection. So aseptic technique, avoiding any sort of, um, you know, things that are not um, like any lines or tubes that um, might lead to infection if we can avoid them and looking for signs of infection is gonna be key. Uh, and then supporting their nutrition, adequate calories, protein, carbs, and fat. And a lot of these patients are gonna be on a sodium restriction. So what overall can I do as the nurse? Um, I'm gonna do a daily weight on these patients to make sure that um, they're staying within their balance and seeing how they're improving, especially because we talked about throughout these phases, they have the oligurk phase where they're not making a lot of urine and they're holding on, they're gonna be overloaded and they're, they're in that diuretic phase where it's the opposite. So I'm also gonna need to do a strict I and O. I really wanna see what their volume status is. I wanna make sure that they stay in a balance because remember in the oligurk holding on to too much diuretic, they're peeing everything out. They can end up getting massively dehydrated in that diuretic phase. So I really need to watch that closely. Um, then aseptic technique, you know, monitoring for infection, meticulous skin care, because their skin has all that waste that's building up. They can get really dry skin. So we really want to watch it closely. Um, and again, they're also fatigued. So they're probably not feeling like moving around and doing much. So I really need to protect that skin. Um, the psychosocial support. And then of course, prevention. Know who's at risk. So if you have a patient come back and, you know, you should always, regardless of what they have going on, even if they seem young and healthy, any patients at risk for acute kidney injury, if they're not getting enough fluids in, they're getting dehydrated. Hydrated. Um, any patients that have heart disease and have low cardiac output are going to be at risk for it. Any patient with diabetes or other things, infection knocks the kidneys out. A lot of medications knock the kidneys out. So it's just knowing what are these common factors? Um, and is there any way that I can, you know, preemptively try to avoid this? You know, if I know I'm given a bunch of medications that are going to be hard on the kidneys, what else can I do? You know, and kind of keeping in touch um, with my doctor and letting them know what are my assessment findings? What are my um, monitoring those labs on a daily basis? the creatinine, the BUN, and see how their kidneys are doing with the other disease processes they have in their body. Um, and then also, you know, if there's any sort of significant fluid loss, blood loss, things like that, replacing, making sure they get that volume back. Because again, one of the main things that causes the kidneys to get knocked out is that they do not get the fluid that they want because they're very selfish, and then they shut down and stop working. So this is overall how we treat AKI, just to kind of get you started and get you ex uh, excited about um, acute kidney injury before we learn about that wonderful chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal. So I'll see you next time. Bye.